don't know if that's what was calling the traffic delays or not, mm -hmm. but it was <laughs> yeah. wasn't part of the plan. That's awesome. Um, her background is really uh, quite incredible, and uh, uh, we're quite fortunate to have her here. Uh, Dr. Sakar was awarded the 2007 Grand Prize by the St. Sar Foundation uh, for an essay, Fearful Symmetry, A New Global Balance of Power. The St. Sar uh, Foundation supports the St. Sar Military Academy, in effect, Francis West Point. Uh, Dr. Sakar was unanimous, unanimously awarded the first grand prize by a jury of four distinguished panelists and her forthcoming publication as an expanded version with a new analysis on that subject. She is currently serving as the senior legal advisor to Caliber Systems, a defense contracting consulting group based in Alexandria, Virginia. Mainly prior to this position, she was the general counsel for the 2005 Defense-Based Closure and Realignment Commission. She also served as the General Counsel for the Overseas Basin Commission prior to joining the BRAC Commission. She was also the former Assistant General Counsel for Administrative Affairs for the Overseas Private Investment Corporation and formerly a staff attorney with the Office of the General Counsel of USAID, also known as the U.S. Agency for International Development. And she began her career as a litigation associate with two Wall Street firms in New York. Uh, she was an adjunct law professor at Georgetown University's Law Center where she taught a graduate law seminar and has extensive uh, uh, published law review articles on a variety of subjects. She was also an adjunct professor at the African Center for Strategic Studies at Fort McNair. A uh, bit of her background, she completed her graduate studies at Bernard College, Columbia University, her law degree, her JD from Antioch School of Law and her Master's of Law, LLM degree and her PhD in philosophy from uh, Newham College, Cambridge University. Thank you for coming. Thank wow. you. Wow. Really appreciate you coming. Uh, quite an impressive background. Just that half of the question, go ahead. Uh, I'm very impressed. I just want to know how in the world, you look so young, how in the world, just, can you just kind of tell me a little bit about how were you able to accomplish all of these schooling? I mean, you got your law yeah. degree. You have your PhD. I mean, when did you start? Did you start right out of high school? I mean, talk to me. Um, I am so glad we're starting this lecture off on, on the right note. Thank you for the compliment. I'm glad I'm young looking. You are young looking, and all of you are vibrant, interesting, oh, wonderful young folks. And it's a real pleasure to share some time with you today. To answer your question more directly in terms of how I got all this education packed into my resume, um, yeah, you might say that I got started early. I graduated from high school early, a year early. I graduated from college a year early, and I graduated from law school a semester early. So when you add all that in, I passed the bar earlier than uh, I should have been graduating from law school. Mm -hmm. So I sort of got out the, uh, <laughs> the blocks, you know, the starting blocks a little bit earlier than some of my uh, comrades, some of my, you know, you know uh, compatriots, comrades, friends from high school. So that gave me a little bit of a, an advantage in terms of time. And also, I was uh, busy. You know, I basically, I didn't plan it this way, quite frankly. Your name is? Holly. Holly. Um, I didn't plan it this way, Holly, but it just sort of happened over time. You know, what happened was that um, I sort of crammed three careers into one. I was sort of stacking different things on top of each other, and I didn't, as I say, plan it that way. But that is sort of what happened. And the way it happened is that, you know, I went through what other people go through, you know, high school, college, law school. And I went overseas to England to do a master's of law. Came back, joined a Wall Street law firm. But what happened is that I started doing um, international development work when I went down to Washington, D.C. I left New York after three years. Went down to uh, Washington, D.C. I'm just going to walk around a little bit so all of you can see me. Um, and then I started doing what's called international development. Does anyone know what I mean by the phrase international development? What does that mean? other governments, other law firms, just, just basically um, development, development, something that probably was negative or in conflict, or something that, something better. Excellent. Urban um, economic growth. Excellent. Yeah. And your name is? Carl. Carl. Excellent. You know, international <laughs> development is exactly as Carl described. It's essentially the U.S. government, uh, in, in my case, the U.S. Agency for International Development, going out to different countries in Latin America, and Europe, Africa, Asia, and basically helping them sort of get their systems up and running, more efficient in terms of you know, capital market growth, the role of women in development, education, health sector improvement, infrastructure, building roads, bridges, 
you name it, USAID did it all. Um, and so I did that for many, many years. Many years, and that was a great foundation because this is where the double stacking happened. Um, what happened when I was um, at USAID, I was doing a lot of travel. Technically, USAID uh, personnel are part of the U.S. Diplomatic Corps. So USAID, the Office of General Counsel, handed me a diplomatic passport and said, here you go, <laughs> go and do your thing. So I went, I ended up going to about 40 different countries, negotiating every kind of legal agreement you can imagine. I wrote them, I negotiated them, it was great fun. And at that point, I wrote to Georgetown Law School, saying, you know, I'd like to teach a class. And I wrote to a couple of other law schools locally as well, saying I'd like to teach a class. And I thought it would be sort of a five-year campaign of like writing the dean, writing the dean, <laughs> hearing nothing. But what happened is that somebody at Georgetown Law School left. Um, he was an adjunct. I was never a tenured faculty, he was an adjunct faculty member. And he left unexpectedly. So the associate dean at Georgetown uh, Law Center called me in a panic. This was around Thanksgiving, <laughs> saying, can you teach for us in January? And I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so it wasn't a five-year writing campaign. It happened like that. Um, luck is a big part of, of uh, life. And so um, I said, sure, I'll teach. And so I organized a lot of what I was doing at USAID because I was still an attorney there at the time. And it was a great, great experience for me. And I taught at Georgetown for many, many years. And I'm sort of on sabbatical now. I, I hope to go back very soon. But essentially what happened is that because I was doing all this practice at USAID, going out into the field, negotiating agreements, going to the USAID missions, talking to folks out there, you know, my American colleagues as well as you know, the countries I was in, and just to give you a, a, an overview of what some of those 40 countries were, how many people heard about El Salvador? OK, how about Niger? <laughs> how about Kenya? Okay, how about the Philippines? Okay, so those were some of the countries that I went to, and there are many, many more as, as I said. But you know, it gave me a chance to sort of move from practice, you know, what I was doing in the field, into theory, because you know, law school is really a theory. Like you're in school now, you're learning how to do things, but you may not really have the hands on experience. Well, because I did have the hands on experience in my class at Georgetown, I would make sure. It, every semester, every time I taught, my students would go through, you know, in-class exercises. So they were negotiating the same kind of agreements I negotiated in the field. So even though it was an in-class exercise, they were doing what I was doing, actually, in practice. And so there was a great sort of um, convergence, a merger of theory plus practice. So I was doing international development. I started this academic career. It's number two. And what happened, number three, this is sort of interesting as well, last year is that um, I was with the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, again, as, as an assistant general counsel at the time. And I dropped out to do some, some basic you know, campaigning, uh, legal consulting. And that's because I wanted to get a position with the administration at the time. So I knew I needed some political credentials, which I, I didn't have. And during that process, because I was sort of in the political world at that time, I got appointed in a semi-political appointment to be the general counsel of the Overseas Basin Commission, which is a military commission. Uh, it lasted for a year, and my executive director said, well, how about joining another commission, the BRAC Commission, the Base Realignment and Closure Commission. Uh, you may have heard of the BRAC Commission. We closed out Walter Reed Hospital. Uh, we've done a number of closures and realignments that you may be familiar with in this particular area. So I joined BRAC as um, their general counsel. And basically, from there, I moved to Calvary, which is a defense consulting firm. So those are my three careers, and they were sort of stacked on top of each other, international development, teaching law, and also doing defense work. And in terms of teaching law, I also publish extensively, including this book, which we'll get to in a bit. But that's a very long <laughs> answer to you, a very simple question. But so Holly, does that, uh, does that explain things? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, good. Well, you know, again, I, I apologize for being late this morning. Um, it's wonderful of you to share your time with me today. I'm really excited about talking to you about some of the work I've been doing. It stems from my Georgetown Law experience, and uh, as I said, I've been publishing consistently throughout. And I wanted to talk to you today, essentially, about Islamic-based forms of fundamentalist terrorism. And I want to begin by thanking Professor Macias, who made this possible. And I also want to thank Professor Baker, who lent his uh, camera and other logistical support <laughs> to this operation, if you like. Um, I want to talk about... Um, global terrorism today, I explain to you why it's relevant to your current studies and your future careers in terms of identifying 
capturing and prosecuting would-be terrorists. In doing so successfully, you will be promulgating, you will be supporting the critical national security interests of the United States. So all of you have, if you pursue a career in this field, of course, all of you have a very important job ahead of you. And it's very important that, in my view, that you understand sort of the lay of the land. And I'll try to explain through some of the complexities of global terrorism to break it down for you to make sure that you understand all of the contradictions in it and all of the threads that kind of run through it, because it is very complex and very difficult to understand. So I plan to, today to offer you a new perspective on the serious problems that terrorism poses for all of us. And I think that this is a particularly good time to do this, because as we mark the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, uh, which is just happening in just a, a few days this Sunday, this is, I think, a very good time to basically you know, step back a little bit, assess where we've been, assess where we need to go, and decide um, what we need to do in terms of next steps to handle the problems posed by global terrorism. So I want to make um, today's session fully interactive. We've made that already possible, thanks to Holly. Um, please ask me questions as we go along. I will reserve a Q&A session afterwards. But please, you know, as, as um, I, I present my notes, so please ask questions as we go along. I want this to make fully, I want to make this session fully interactive. So any questions before I go forward from this point? Okay. Well, first, I want to, in terms of say, setting out, you know, a roadmap for today's uh, discussion, I want to talk about some basics before we get into the specifics of, of global terrorism vis-a-vis -vis Islamic fundamentalist-based global terrorism. First, I want to start with some basics in terms of deciding what a basic definition of global terrorism is. Does anyone want to venture a guess? I know you've been studying this topic for a while. Does anyone want to talk about what they think global terrorism means in terms of the definition? To strike fear in other countries at home, also basically, um, they 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 fight for what they believe is right. Um, it's just to strike fear. That's that's what we basically learn. Um, for political.